On the data analysis side, that's also regulated by J211. And I'm going to read this directly because it's great. Scale factor. A check of accuracy shall be applied to each analog input before every test, rather than relying on set gain values. Well, what's that about? That's about cross-checking the work. You know? Hopefully you want a system where you've empirically validated the sensors and then the software actually runs a cross-check to make sure that you know, you're getting what you think you're getting. Zeroing. Data zero is very important. Now this is separate from the hardware zero, the zero measured offset. Data zero simply means how do I tell the processing software that this is my zero level? Sensors drift over time and temperature, but the, the uh, impact test is over in a split second. So what we want to do is zero the data typically immediately before impact so that you know, we take all that, that time and temperature drift out of it. And basically J211 says you must have a system in place that post-test you software zero the data to make it meaningful and comparable. Sign conventions. Okay, we know there's, there's X, you know, fore and aft, Y, left and right, and Z up and down. But what's positive? What if the dummy is in a seated position or a standing position? You know, you have to think about this stuff. And, and uh, J211 that you have in your, your packets there actually has, has some diagrams that help you understand that. It's affected by the mounting of the transducers, by the way you wire them, um, and even by the numbers you put into the software. Again, this is where you really need an empirical test. When you run a test, you think you've done everything right, and then you hit the dummy on the back of the head to accelerate the head forward, and it better go positive. You hit him on the left side of the head to make it go to the right, that better be positive. These are the kinds of things you do in the test world to make sure you're getting the right, what you think you're getting. So again, back to the empirical checks, very important. Um, I know this seems a little, little wild, but a lot of people um, actually take the dummy and just manipulate it when it's, uh, w after it's all wired up and running, perhaps in the real-time data display mode. You know, you can actually take the dummy and roll him over on his back, roll him onto his side, and, and confirm the polarities, remembering that, that the surface of the Earth is always pushing us up with 1G. So the filtering technique that we are required to apply in software, um, basically we get data from the data acquisition system and then we apply the software filter in accordance with J211 and then we run our injury calcul calculations. We have to do it in that order. The software filtering is very well defined. There are only four frequency classes in J211. Class 60, and class 180. Now it looks a little bit, you know, uh, maybe a little hard to understand, but here's a table where all the points on the frequency do, um, axis are defined. F sub L is the lowest frequency, F sub H is the highest frequency of interest, and the corridors are well defined by the graph and by the numbers. So if you're using software, for, in for instance, a data analysis package like Diadem or some other um, analysis package, um, the filters that are programmed in there have to fall into these corridors. There's class 60 and class 1000. Now these corridors look a little different because in the standard, if you read the fine print, you're allowed to develop your, your system performance differently between the, the 60 and 180 and the 60 and 600 and 1000. What filter class do you use? Well, there's a nice table in SAJ211. If you want to know what filter frequency to apply to the lumbar moments from the lumbar load cell, you just go to the table and it says, okay, you need to use CFC 60, 600. What does that mean? It means that my data, if I plug in the numbers for the class 600 here, need to fall into this, into this window. Okay. Let's just, in the real world, what does filtering do for you? Well, here's, here's a crash pulse that I actually, um, actually got from one of, the, one of the CAMI documents. And um, this was something that was done 
to sort of show the huge difference that happens when you filter something at 1,000 hertz versus 60 hertz. Now, most whole vehicle or sled accelerations, you filter at class 60. Well, why is that? Well, in something like a sled or the sheet metal in a vehicle or an airplane fuselage, there's a lot of local vibration in the metal. Well, guess what? That doesn't matter to injuries. That little bit of buzzing in the metal is not important. What's important is, is the filtered black line here, which shows what, what I refer to as the whole body acceleration. So you can see if you don't apply the right filter, your sled pulse came out at 21.2 G's peak, when in reality, if you do it the way it's supposed to be done, you know, at 16.7. So you need to make sure you're using the right filtering. It affects the phasing of the data, and it also affects the amplitude. One note here, um, you know, it, it's often difficult to make sense of certain kinds of impact data. But one of the tools that I like to use a lot is, is simply comparing data's, data from different locations in a test in, in an overlay kind of way. So for example, um, gee, I saw something funny in my head accelerometer. Well, is there anything that correlates with that in the neck load cell, right? because forces that cause acceleration should be measurable by the, by the force transducer. So, you know, more often, you know, very often uh, there's questions about whether or not the data's got a problem. Um, gee, was a transducer loose or is it broken? And uh, so anyway, overlaying data plots is, is a great tool and a way to think, you know, out of the box. Okay, I've got an acceleration that's funny here. Well, what did my moment do in the x-axis? Because that's the one that would have been excited by that.